let's go ahead and get started. It's good to see each and every one of you. We're glad you're here. I want this to be very, very informal. And so this is not designed to be a lecture. If anyone has a question or a comment, if you'll just wave me down some way and let me know, I won't hear your input. Uh, but I'd like to start uh, with a word of prayer. Brother Eric, would you come up here and lead us in a word of prayer? Father in heaven, we are so thankful for another opportunity to be together with one another. Father, we're thankful for another opportunity to further our ministries and to further our knowledge of your word. Father, we pray that you'll be with us through this hour that the things Brother Ted lets us know about, that it'll help us and hopefully it'll add souls to your kingdom. Father, we want to pray for all those on our hearts and minds that may be suffering from sickness or grief or any matters that may be troubling. Father, we just pray that they'll look to you for guidance and comfort. Father, we pray that you'll be with us as we try to improve our knowledge in our lives and that we'll remember to walk on the path of righteousness. Father, we pray that if we often fall short, if we have any sin, that you'll forgive us and that we'll be acceptable and have a home in heaven with you. All these things we want to ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Brother Eric Cheney is a fine gospel Amen. preacher and um, he preaches every Lord's Day um, on a regular basis and has known since he was about four he was going to be a gospel preacher. Some of that might have something to do with being Wayne Kilpatrick's nephew. I don't know. But uh, we're, we're proud of all of our students. And we have several students in here right now, uh, both undergraduate and graduate. And we're very pleased with them. And Eric is a fine example. And uh, so is Brother Neil and Brother Trent and AJ and uh, Brother Barry, Brother Ben, Brother JR is... Even though he's been a student here since the very beginning of the school, <laughs> he still comes in all its courses and really helps us out because he has a lot of wisdom okay. that we're very, very appreciative. Thank you, man. Um, I have a little, uh, little sheet here I need to give. If you don't have one, so if you'll raise your hand, I'll get it to you. It's nothing profound. Let, let me give you a, just a little example. Um, every Sunday, I do a children's bulletin. It's bigger than this, but uh, it goes along with the sermon. And the kids can fill out blanks, and they can uh, have a find a word puzzle on it. And uh, so I do one for each lesson on Sunday so the kids can be involved. And uh, we have, now you may not approve of this, but we have a little treasure chest up beside the pulpit. Uh, <clears throat> and it's a metal one. And uh, some of our ladies stock that with fun stuff. And after uh, worship service, if the children will turn in those to us, our church secretary will draw one out on Monday. And then we run their name in the bulletin, run their name on the screen. And the next Sunday, they can go after church services and get a a surprise out of a little treasure chest. Uh, that was my was not my idea, and quite frankly, it adds about 45 minutes a week to the sermon preparation, but it involves a lot of kids, and they really, really get into it. And uh, so I got a pitiful little note last Sunday from one little girl. She's in the second grade, and she said, I have not won this in a long time. Please pick my name. <laughs> so... She's, she's going to win. No, I don't know. I don't know which one the secretary is going to pull out. But um, if you notice on this, I have put flames at the bottom of this. I don't know who uh, Miller Insurance Associates are, but I borrowed their logo because uh, to me, the heat is on sometimes when we're asked to speak on controversial uh, topics and difficult topics. 
So I was asking some of my uh, friends who preach, uh, what could you do, <coughs> what would you do if you had a controversial or difficult subject that you need to speak on in? One of them said, plan a vacation that week or a resignation. I thought that was pretty drastic. Uh, the other one said, that's why we have youth ministers. And how do you brethren feel about that, who are in youth ministry? And then, I like this one the best. This was one of my colleagues here at Heritage. I will not let you guess which one it was. <laughs> Get a job teaching at a Christian university and assign students that topic for a term paper and see what they say. <laughs> now, I, I think that's a pretty good idea. Come in, Brother Mel. I, I, I'm going to need to get another Is chair. Is there any room in the end? Uh, yes, there's always. We've got this manger down here. <laughs> Now, all those are kind of said tongue-in-cheek, but the truth is we all have to speak from controversial topics from time to time. And uh, we'll talk about some of those as, as we go on today. But what I want to do, and you'll notice this on the little uh, handout sheet, uh, I have seven suggestions today, and I want us to not only learn from each other and from God's Word, but I also want us to have fun doing it. And I don't apologize for that at all. Amen. I don't think it has to be boring to be beneficial. And so uh, I want us to look at seven things, and you may not like these, and, and I, I'm sorry if you don't, but you can take it up with my wife, and maybe she'll write a different next time. Number one, do not just preach the company position. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, the company position, uh, you know, if you heard the brothers, uh, present, Brother Bill Perkins' presentation on the Holy Spirit today, Brother Perkins did not just preach the company position. Because the company position would be that the word, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, that uh, the Spirit works exclusively through the word. Now, he uh, did a good job exploring that, and I'm looking forward to hearing tomorrow's lessons. And, and learning more and, uh, and, and applying to more. Now, I, I've uh, put a picture up here. Now, uh, for those uh, in my homiletics class on Tuesday morning, uh, what's, what is this? Th this is a woman, in case you didn't know. Uh, but what's this other thing? Washing machine. Yeah, a washing machine. Yeah. What kind of washing machine? Ringer. A ringer. Has anybody ever told you, man, I've been through the ringer? Amen. I've been put through the ringer. All right, so what was the problem with ringer washers? You know, you wash down here in the tub, but then this would wring the water out. I think this woman even has an electric model. Uh, my Aunt Eula had one that was actually a crank. It, you didn't, it wasn't an electric, you had to crank it out. Uh, so what was the problem with the ring? Many problems with the ringer washer, but what was one of the big problems that salespeople had with a ringer washer? Yeah, get your hand caught. What was another one with your, regarding your clothes? If you didn't have wooden buttons or rubber buttons, what happened to the buttons? It break. So I knew this, uh, I heard about this guy, I didn't know him personally, but he, he sold Ringer Washer's own uh, commission for a company. And his wife had one, and every week she had to sew some buttons back on his shirts because it would break. But his boss said, now look, if they ask you if it breaks the buttons, you say, no, this is a new improved model. Now you're selling on commission, so where's the dilemma there? He had to sell something he didn't believe in. So what if you're asked to speak on something you don't believe in and the Bible doesn't teach it? You better not do it. If it's not uh, a faith, what is it? It's sin. It's sin. So we need to be careful not to just preach the company position. Now, I don't mean that up, but unless the Bible teaches it, it's not from God. I don't believe there's such a thing as church doctrine and Bible doctrine Amen. unless it's the same. If it's not Bible doctrine, it better not be church doctrine because if it is, we're in trouble. 
I've asked you, if you will, to look at Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. And let's look at a company position. What I mean by that. So let's notice Galatians chapter 2, starting at verse 11. Galatians 2 and verse 11. In Galatians 2 and verse 11. Well, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. But before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. I present to you that I believe Peter was playing the company position. Yeah. That he was just doing what he had to do to get along with the Jews. And I, I have a confession to you today. In my earlier years, and possibly even in later years, I, I've been forced to play the company position. I knew what the elders believed on that topic, and I knew what... The congregation believed on that topic, but it wasn't what the Bible taught on that topic. But I had to make a choice, and I'm ashamed to say this, sometimes I chose to keep a job. That's a confession. But if we're going to preach on difficult and controversial subjects, and we will, then let's make sure that we do not just preach the company position. Okay, before I go any further... Who has a comment or a question about that? I think a lot of us have found ourselves in a position you just mentioned a while ago. Yes, sir. Trying to keep a job. Yes, sir. Whether we like that or not, it's there. Yes, sir. Anyone else? I had a situation in one of the congregations where the elders, well, one of the elders, wanted me to speak on divorce and remarriage every three months. Mm -hmm. And I told him I would not do that. And he told me why, and I told him, I said, because if you preach on it that often, then you're letting the congregation know that we've got a problem within the congregation. Yeah, right. Well, if, you know, I don't know if y'all know the term hobby horse, mm -hmm. but if we're not careful, we can get on the hobby horse. Uh, someone, I won't say the name, but someone gave me a list of 12 things that Lynn Beck had said that all preachers need to preach on at least once a month. <laughs> right. It was abortion and homosexual. Look, I'm not here to preach politics. Okay. I'm here to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I, I, I'm, 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 I'm like you. That would be a tough pill to swallow. But let's move on. And uh, let's look at the second one uh, of our seven suggestions. And this is preach controversial stuff from a manuscript. If it's going to be really controversial, use a manuscript. Now, why would you do that? So you won't deviate. You stay focused. Yes, sir. You won't deviate. You'll stay focused. <laughs> and also, unless it's recorded, what do you have, Brother Robin? You've got proof of what you said yes, and sir. what you didn't say. That's exactly right. <laughs> um, I, I put up here for K Filet. Uh, K Filet, of course, is the uh, uh, feminine noun for. Uh, the head. Now, some of our more progressive folks are saying it says it means source, like the mouth of a river or the head of a river. I, I've only found one time in the scriptures it means source. All the other times it means head. So, I, I was doing my MDF and I wrote a uh, a term paper on Cape Filet, and uh, I, I remember. I guess I made a mistake, but I had to double dip. You know what double dipping is? If you're studying something for school, if I could use it as a sermon, I turned around and used it as a sermon. Whether that was right or wrong, that's the only way I could get through graduate school. And uh, I remember preaching on Cape Filet, and uh, my wife, when we got home, my wife said, you know what, that, that sounded a lot like a college course. <laughs> and I, I, I know why. <laughs> it, it actually was a... Master's course, it wasn't just a college course. And so there was a congregation in Kolioka, Tennessee. I love Kolioka. Uh, it's a great church. I've been there many times for gospel meetings. 
But the preacher there at the time, Brother Grady Pitts, called me on Monday. He said, some of our brethren watched you on television yesterday, and they think you, they think you talk false doctrine. I said, well, I'll tell you what, Brother Grady, uh, I want to send you the tape. That was back when cassette. I know some of y'all don't know what that was, but we used to have these little tapes, Amen. cassettes. And uh, I sent them the cassette tape, and uh, I sent them the manuscript, and I said, uh, could I come and meet with you? He said, so I sent seven copies. I think that's how many elders I had. And seven copies of the tape. And I, I called him about the next week, gave him time. I said, um, when can I come to? He said, I said, once they read it, they didn't understand it anyway. And they said, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's look at Acts 15. Acts 15, 22 through 29. You remember this uh, Jerusalem Council, Acts 15, 22 through 29? Now, they were having a problem because uh, Gentiles, lo and behold, Gentiles were being accepted into the Lord. And they just wasn't sure that that was right. Come on in, Brother Randy. There's a seat right here. Thank you. So notice what they did. They could have just told uh, Paul and Barnabas and Silas and others just to go out and tell it. But notice what they did. They wrote it down because it was important and they wanted to make sure the message was out exactly the way the apostles and elders wanted it to be said. And so if you'll notice, starting in verse 23, uh, quotation marks there. Uh, some of our Bibles will have quotation marks in the middle of verse 23, and it goes all the way through uh, verse 29, because you have the exact manuscript. Well, we don't have the autograph, but we have the exact copy of what they wrote. I, I'm going to present to you that I think when we're preaching controversial stuff, stuff is probably not a scholarly term, but I think you understand that I'm not trying to be scholarly. I think controversial stuff needs to be from a manuscript. Now, I... I typically don't like to preach from manuscripts because I spend too much time reading and not enough time eye contact. But on controversial stuff, I think it's very important to have a manuscript. Well, there's so so many folks in this room that have so much more wisdom than I would on that. Who has some comments about that? Who has a follow-up to, to that? Is that? Is that a good idea? Is it a bad idea? The only thing that I would say about it is, is that sometimes that gives folks the fodder as well to that they can dissect. And, and unfortunately, even sometimes the manuscript is not, um, you know, there is, there is this idea of communication that is lost on a manuscript sure. that might have been said... For example, tongue-in-cheek, right, right. that absolutely could be misconstrued into some kind of thing. So there is a pitfall to a manuscript. If, that's if that's exactly think. right. That's exactly right. That's the reason I, I like to back it up with a recording, if I can. Yes. To say the context in which I said it, the, the tone <clears throat> in which I said it. Because, uh, you know, people can say... Uh, things in a different tone say the exact same words but in a different tone. Uh, you know, my, my wife can say, uh, Ted, will you take out the trash? And I can say, well, sure, honey, I, I will. And, and I'll get to eat supper that night. But if I say, sure, honey, I will, that the, the context is the same, the words are the same, but the tone is different. And so a manuscript, you're right, a manuscript doesn't always do it. Any other input on that? Yes. I, you know, I agree with the manuscript thing, but I guess to put my money where my mouth is, I, I'm more with Holy Spirit reliant in my preaching these days, and I, I feel like since I've gone to less notes, my preaching's probably gotten stronger. Yeah, well, I, I don't use a lot of notes. I guess our folks can tell. But um, I, I would you, sometimes it's better to go with a transcript <coughs> than a manuscript so that you can say, 
you know, you can have what you yeah, actually said. Yeah. I use uh, Dragon uh, software and, uh, you know, don't have to type it out. I can say, say something and uh, it's a little slower than I talk, although I'm from Alabama, I talk kind of slow. But um, it, this Dragon software, uh, it, it will type out what you've said. And in the newer versions, you can actually play a recording through it, and it will make a transcript of it. Kind of like a telepro, uh, kind of like a, the words that run across the bottom of your screen. You know, you have it on uh, mute. Well, let's move to the third, third one. I appreciate your help. Let uh, controversial sermons grow in your homiletical garden. Andrew Blackwood was the one who came up with the uh, term homiletical garden. Uh, and let, let's talk about what a homiletical garden is. Uh, this is what I advise our preaching students here to do. Uh, now, I was raised on a farm, and, and my daddy would plant corn, uh, a row or two of corn in our garden at different times. We'd have some early corn, and then we'd have some middle corn, uh, and then we'd have some late corn. Now, why would you do that? <laughs> it, it, it was trash to see. So you'd have some corn. Because if you just plant it all at once, then, you know, it might be, uh, you know, we called them roasting ears. I guess that was roasting ears, but you just, you know, we ran it together, roasting ears. Um, you know, they'd be too tough to eat. And so we'd say, I think we ought to do the same principle with sermons. We ought, we ought to have something in the beginning stages, in the middle, and in the in the latter stages. So that um, I do plan preaching. I try to plan in advance a year of what I'm going to say. Now that could change because the elders could ask me to speak on a series. We're about to appoint new elders, hopefully at Hamilton, and uh, where I have the privilege of serving. And, um, you know, I, I'm going to do a series, the Lord willing, on, on the elders and their qualifications. And I didn't plan that. I didn't find that out when I planned it last October, but I was going to. And so we're, we're going to veer off. Remember, uh, man was not made for the Sabbath, but Sabbath was made for the man. Well, the planned preaching was made for the preacher, and the preacher wasn't made for it. So you have to veer off of it sometimes. Uh, Brother Bill and I have already mentioned today, my Paul Rogers, um, my wife is from Centerville, Tennessee, and when uh, she and I married, uh, we moved there. I worked for McDonald Funeral Home and uh, was a radio announcer there in, before I started preaching. And Brother Paul, I went to see him one day after I decided I wanted to preach. And uh, I was in his office. And if you ever went in Paul Rogers' office, it was just like going through the jungle. It was just <laughs> piled up. He knew where everything was, but uh, only the Lord knew where it was. So uh, he had to go to the restroom, which gave me a little time uh, to prowl. Uh, not that I was nosy, I just uh, needed to know what was going on. So uh, I looked behind his desk, and Brother Bill, I remember counting. Uh, he was gone a long time, must have been number two. But anyway, uh, he had 153 folders lined up behind his desk against the wall. And I, when he came back in, I I said, Brother Paul, I need to ask you a question. Where are all those folders there? He said, well, over there against the, in that corner, I remember in that corner, he said, those are the ones I've just started. And I'm just going to put some stuff in it, you know. And I know the title. That's about all I know, the title and the text. But as I read and I study, I'll think, you know, you know what, that'll go with that. And he said, I'll drop it in. And he said, over here, those thick ones are the ones I've added stuff to. <coughs> and, you know, that's my homiletical card. That's the ones I'm going to pick. Now, the problem is, if you're going to preach on a controversial or difficult topic, you can't wait till Saturday night. You know, all of us, I don't know if all of you are guilty, but I'm guilty of times of, of, of getting to Saturday night. It's been a crazy week, um, you know, visiting and counseling and funerals and weddings and Amen. barbecues that, you know, and, and I've ended up on Saturday night before and, and have to cram. Don't cram on us controversial. You're going to bury yourself. You're going to say something. 
You should not have said uh, if you wait till till that time. And so uh, there used to be a commercial on TV. I, I'm not a uh, I'm not a a wine drinker. Uh, I don't. I'm a teetotaler. But uh, you know, before be thirsty, my friend. Before that commercial was on, there was one that says, "We will sell no wine before it's time." Do you remember that? Some of you, some of us. Who are you? And what you do with that? But um, I, I, I've adopted that. We will preach no controversial sermon before it's time. So, if it comes time, unless you're on the lectureship or alumni days, and it comes time to speak. You've got to meet a deadline, unless you've already announced it. Put that <laughs> controversial topic off. And just go ahead and preach your sermon on love that you use when you try out somewhere. Just go ahead and use it. But uh, don't, don't rush those controversial topics. Let them, let them marinate. Let them gel. Okay? Any comments about that? You know, Ted, this has never really happened, but I have asked my elders in the past, if I preach on a very tough topic, it would be so nice if when I finish, one of you all would come up and say, amen, the eldership stands behind that, and we hope you all will hate it or something like that. And we could get our leadership to, to some buy support us on these. It would be very nice. Amen. Uh, I had a wonderful relationship at uh, West Seventh with Columbia when I was there for 16 years. Um, and when the elders knew I was going to speak on a controversial topic, one of them would get up and say, uh, we believe the word of God has been preached today, and, we, and we're standing behind it, and we're standing behind our preacher. And um, you know what? It wasn't an ego thing, but uh, that's a load off. No, I took a load off. That, that was a blessing. And uh, that's the only place I've ever experienced that. But it was a good eldership good, godly men, and they took it seriously. I, 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 if you're uh, one of the elders in the congregation where you serve, and uh, please consider doing that. I mean, the preachers in this room, uh, would that mean anything to you if your elders got up to back you up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who are you? What you do with my elders? <laughs> <laughs> Number four. Number four. <laughs> Read the text in several translations regarding uh, researching the hard words you do not understand. Brother Tom Holland uh, taught my first uh, sermon preparation class. It was called Prepping Dale. Uh, and Brother Holland used to say, underline all the hard words. Underline all the hard words. Make sure that uh, you have researched those. And so... Uh, Read the text. I, I, I want you to run a little experiment with me. If you will, look in the, your Bible. I, I know some of you are using electronic devices and you have several translations. That might be very helpful. Uh, I like to teach class out of this, uh, this Bible. It's uh, the parallel New Testament. I wish it didn't say the contemporary parallel because that makes some of our folks nervous. But the parallel New Testament, it has eight translations in it for so, uh, I, I want to read, you to read with me, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 3. 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 3. I'll give you time to <coughs> turn to that or type that in. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 3. <coughs> so, let's just look at this. Uh, <coughs> would someone read that from, and tell us what translation you're reading from and read it aloud. New American Standard. Husband must fulfill his duty to the wife, and wife's wife also the wife to her husband. Okay, fulfill his duty. I, I think that's a that's a better translation than some of the the, the wording. <coughs> All right, and, and I'm not trying to embarrass anyone, or I'm not trying to make fun of the text. I promise. All right, someone from another translation. New King James. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due to her, yeah. and likewise also the wife to her husband. I think that I think that's a good good way of translating it. I, I, I believe we can understand that. Someone else. English standard. 
The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. Uh, conjugal rights. Uh, <laughs> did you know that this, if you go to a prison where they have conjugal visits, this is the legal sign that's beside the bedroom door where they can visit? Conjugal rights. That sounds like a jail term to me. But, you know, I, I like the ESV. I often use the ESV. I'm not running down the ESV. But I wonder how many of our teenagers will know what conjugal rights are. So, uh, so uh, anyone with another one? King James. Yes. <laughs> Let the husband render to the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife to the husband. Yes. <laughs> due benevolence. Um, I'm not sure we all understand. I mean, we all understand it, but I'm not sure someone who's a first-time reader would understand what that means. And again, I'm not trying to belittle the text. I'm just trying to show that there, there are words and there are phrases that we really need to research and explore. Um, any other translations? And I, like the, I like the study from the, it's called God's Word. Kind yes, of yes. Husbands and wives should satisfy each other's sexual needs. Yeah. I mean... Uh, that's, that's about as clear as you can get. <laughs> the New Century Version, by the way, you know, it is translated on a third grade reading level. I, I like it. Uh, because I can usually understand third grade. He, uh, the husband is to give that which he owes her as his wife. My wife thinks that's the credit card. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so, you know, that doesn't always <clears throat> translate. You know what I mean? Um, contemporary English version, uh, they should be fair with each other about having sex. And the New English, uh, excuse me, the New Living Translation, which I know some of you uh, despise, uh, I like to use it as a commentary. It explains things to me sometimes that I, I just didn't understand. The husband must not deprive his wife of sexual intimacy, which is her right as a married woman. Now remember, at this time, marriages were arranged. Do you know love marriages are only about 200 years old? It's really an American invention. And so these were arranged marriages. Yes. The easy read version? Yes. The husband should give his wife what she deserves as his wife. Okay, all right, I, I understand. So, uh, my, my point is, read the text. If, if you are uh, gifted and blessed, like some of you, to be able to read the uh, English and the uh, Greek and the Hebrew, you know, I, I wish Nathan Daly were in here. I don't know if y'all know Nathan. He's uh, one of our fine instructors here. Uh, He's probably going to listen to this. Just, I think he knows about 14 languages. That's fine. If you're mad. But I'm Ted. I, I barely, I can't even speak pig Latin. You know? And so I'm going to have to read it in several translations to get the meaning. I, I know how to look it up and buy our English danker and some of those things. But um, I want to do that after I've done my, my study myself before I go open another source. Any suggestions about this number? Okay, let's go to number five here. Use a lifeline. Call a wise friend. A wise friend. Yes. <laughs> Not a wise guy, but a wise friend. Um, did any of you know Jane Noel Meredith? Did any of you remember J. Noel Meredith? Um, he has a son, Paul Meredith, that's preaching at Ohio Valley. Uh, J. Noel died with a heart attack in, at age 51, but he made a big impact while he was here. He wrote a uh, commentary on Galatians. He uh, used to write, uh, he had a paper, Christian Light. And uh, J. Noel, I used to work for him when I was an early first time preacher. Um, I didn't I didn't make enough money to survive and the elder said, well, you can find a job. And So I ran his printing presses. 
and would sell his books. We'd go to lectureships, and I'd run the booth while he was preaching. It would take the money and run. No, <laughs> so uh, I, I learned a lot from Daniel. And um, you know, one time we were traveling to uh, Montgomery to uh, what used to be the Alabama Christian Graduate School of Religion, I believe, which is now uh, Amherst University. And we were at the old landmark church building. And on the way down there, Jane Oil said, you know, I don't like the song, I'll Fly Away. I just don't like it. Well, I was too afraid to ask him why he didn't like it. <laughs> it's kind of like uh, when the disciples of the Lord came back and they saw Jesus talking to the woman as well. They wondered why he's talking to them, but no one dared to ask him. <laughs> well, not that Jane Oil was the Lord, but I was afraid to ask him. So I held my first gospel meeting the next, that summer, down at Folkestone, Georgia. That's on the Georgia-Florida line. And uh, there were only about 18 there, I think. And I was leading the singing and doing the preaching. And uh, somebody, after it, somebody said, why don't you just take some requests? And I, I'm, I'm 21. And I thought, First song they requested is, I'll fly away. I said, I don't like I'll fly away. <laughs> and then I wasn't prepared for the next question. Why? And um, I couldn't say because Brother Meredith doesn't like it. Because that would just show, show how shallow I am. And so I said, oh, I don't know. Let's just leave it. What a fool. Just, just, just what a fool. Uh, but you see, I just took the words of a friend without studying it myself. And by the way, I, I like I'll Fly Away, and we can just sing it if you want to. But my point is, don't just take it because someone else said it. Amen. Know it. Know it from God's Word. Okay, um, any comments about this one? Before we go any further, I was supposed to, supposed to uh, no, this is the next one, I'm sorry. <laughs> Do research. Wikipedia is not a scholarly website. <laughs> this is Stan Mitchell. Brother Stan Mitchell is a great missionary, and he teaches Bible at Free Hardman. They opened a new library at Free Hardman the other day. It had been down for about two years because they were remodeling it. And on Facebook, he said, so there's a building open on our campus with pre-Wikipedia technology on the shelves. You should check it out. Don't, don't just go to Sermon Central and get up your sermons. Do research. Now, these are two of my favorite books on controversial um, and difficult text. Brother Wendell Winkler. Any of you remember Brother Amen. Wendell Winkler? Brother Wendell Winkler uh, did a great service to the Brotherhood, I believe, uh, in many ways. But in 1981, at the uh, Fort Worth Brown Trail School of Preaching uh, in Bedford or Fort Worth, Texas, the lectureship that year was Difficult Texts of the New Testament. And the next year, Difficult Texts of the Old Testament explained. Very good stuff. And um, Brother... Uh, Dan Winkler up at Huntington, Tennessee. I didn't even know these were still available. I had the New Testament, but for some reason I missed the Old Testament. And I thought, it's gone forever. I'll never get it. But he's republished these. And I bought this one at the Freed Hartman Lectures back in February. Uh, these are two of the best sources. You know, I know, I know that uh, they're older than some of you. But um, you, you have excellent, excellent uh, writings. Just let me read some of the names here uh, of some of the folks that that have. Uh, he didn't write all this. This is a lectureship. Uh, Brother Winkler, W. B. West, Roy Beaver, Wayne Jackson, Hugh Fulford, um, several more. Johnny Ramsey. You know, you could go wrong listening to a lot of other folks before you'll go wrong listening to those guys. So. Those are two sources that I've really, really, uh, after you do your own Bible study, don't go to these first. 
do your own Bible study, but I, I, I'd like to use, I was doing research, and by the way, uh, Professor Jamie Cox, our librarian here, uh, lives in the library practically, and uh, she can help you with that. And if you, you uh, have someone that helps you with research that can refer, uh, one of my best friends and uh, a brother, uh, in Christ and almost a brother in the flesh to me is Sellers Crane. Sellers uh, has recently retired from the Rivergate Church of Christ as a in uh, Goodlettsville up above Nashville as a as the preacher, but he still serves as one of the elders. Um, Sellers helps me. I'll say Sellers, I've run into a this is kind of like call a friend. I've run into a, a something I need some help on. He'll say, Well, why don't you read? So, and so when I was doing my doctorate at Harding uh, in Memphis, um, I, I, I appreciated the librarian there, Brother uh, Don Meredith. And I'd just be walking across the, uh, between the classrooms, just going across the campus, and uh, Brother Meredith would say, Hey, Burroughs, he's never been one for, you know, bedside matter. Uh, but, hey, Burroughs, yes, sir. What are you writing your paper on? I'm writing on. Marriage in the home. Go to upstairs, third shelf on the left, eye level, fourth book to the right. There's a there's a book there you need to read. Wow, I need him to just follow me. <laughs> no, he wore me out. I don't want him following me around. I never would rest. But you know, you need somebody that will push you and will help you with your research. Okay, I've talked too much. Who has some comments? Maybe I'm giving my age away, but I agree. Those two books are some of the best in the Brotherhood. Oh, man. I, really right. I love them. I didn't realize I was about out of time. Let's look at this one. Do, do not be dogmatic. Do not be dogmatic. I put on here, how many children must an elder have? Now, I'm not trying to cause a controversy. But until I was probably 30, I knew the answer to that. Had to be two or more. Because it said children. I no longer believe that. Amen. I believe it's the ability to raise children, not the biological ability to produce children. And so, don't be dogmatic. And there have been times I've been dogmatic. Like, uh, you know, I know that in heaven we're going to drink Dr. Pepper, but I can't prove it yet. So, uh, um, I, this is a quote. It's, it's not from anybody famous, but it was made today. No, it's going to be made tomorrow, I guess. It is dangerous to publish because your work will outlive you. It's obvious when you switch positions. I'm so thankful some of the stuff I wrote in the 80s has gone out of print. I'm so thankful. Because uh, somebody could say, now wait a minute. Back in the 80s, you said this. And now you're saying this. The Word of God hasn't changed but my understanding of the Word of God often changes because uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I need a t-shirt, I guess, that says the Lord is not through with me yet. And so I'm still studying. And every time I study, I learn something new from the Lord. Well, what would you add to those comments? Do not be dogmatic or anything else. This is not meant to be an exhaustive list. Usually, when somebody questions me on something, I, will, I try to say, well, I'm just as dogmatic as the scriptures allow me to be. Yes, yes. You know, that doesn't mean I'm wishy-washy on doctrine. No. But uh, when it comes to matters of, uh, <coughs> matters of judgment, matters of opinion, yeah. don't draw lines of fellowship on that. <coughs> you know, uh, I know, I know brethren, they mean well. But if you do not preach from the King James Version, you're a heretic to them. So, you know. Hate to disappoint them. Yes. Well, uh, I thought that's like Jesus. You. <laughs> <laughs> we had a missionary from Belgium that was meeting with our elders at one place I worked, and uh, he was talking about it. And uh, one of the elders finally said, "Now." 
Now let me ask you something. Do you use uh, the King James Version when you're preaching in Belgium? Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, no. Uh, they don't speak English. <laughs> and he said, then we're dropping your story. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's not be there. Let's not be there. I, I, I was raised on the King James. I, if I quote, I quote the King James. That's, that was my mother and father. And I can teach somebody how to go to heaven out of it, okay? I think it's a good translation. But I'm not going to draw lines of fellowship over here. No. Y'all have been so kind to give me your uh, this time of yours. And I appreciate it very much.